All right, today we're going to go over chapter 6, and chapter 6 starts on page 227, but rather than going into the book right away, I gave you a handout, and also you, I, I um, emailed you a zipped copy of the handout. So if you want to unzip that and bring that up in Visual Studio, that probably would help. I'm trying to give you, like, uh, most of the major stuff with arrays just at one time before we go over it in the book, because I think it'll make more sense, or at least my hope is that it makes more sense if you see it in action, so to speak. Now, just so you know, right now, virtually the whole program is commented out, so I, I wrote it that way because I, I, everything has been tested, but I want to take stuff and, and move it in and out of being commented as we go on in here. It's a console app. It's a relatively simple console app. All right, so we're going to be able to go over everything. And then, like I said, ideally then, when we go over what uh, arrays actually are in the book, it's going to make a lot more sense to you. So here it is. I don't know how it got goofed up with, the, with that, but it's called working with arrays. All right. I'll give you a second to try to uh, unzip that and put it onto your desktop. Like I said, we're going to be taking stuff that's in here and we're going to be commenting it in and then commenting it out as we go on. All right, so taking it from the top here, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to grab line 14 here that's commented out and I'm going to uncomment that and line 21 which is commented out so I've got that so what I want you to do is please take a look up on the screen right here what I just commented out was this it's not that this is a big thing but I'm trying to show you syntax all right this array right now has got a list of values in fact this array is known as having an array initializer list that's on the test all right you have to know what an array initializer list is and what an initializer list is is when you declare an array you immediately give it values I think you'd look you'd agree with that that the way I've done this I've given it values so this is value 0 this is value 1 value 2 value 3 and value 4 does that make sense to everyone all right also, the length of this array that's called names is 5. It doesn't matter that it goes from 0 to 4. The length is 5. Length is a built-in array property. So if I wanted to print out how, you know, how many elements were in the array, I could do something like this. I can say right line. There are... Right? There are that many names in the names array. Now that should work. I don't know if I need a dot to string on that or not, but I'll put it in anyway. All right, so let's, let's see if indeed this works. So I'm going to run this. Oh, I don't have a read line there, so. I do, but it's commented out. So if you look at it, okay, it shows you the names and it says how many there are, all right? Now, the way that I normally explain arrays, and maybe this will make sense to you, maybe it won't, I don't know, all right? But I just wanted to show you this. I'm going to bring up, and it's interesting. Whenever I've explained this in the past, I've said, okay, we're going to imagine that you live in an apartment, and if you don't, you know somebody who lives in an apartment or whatever. And when I gave this lecture before, the last time I lived in an apartment, I don't know how old I was, but maybe a third of my age right now, all right? But the point is this. In the apartment complex that I live in right now, in the building that I'm in, there are literally, there are eight units in there, okay? So if we come in there and we say, you know, and again, this is, maybe I'm making this too simplistic, I don't know. 
All right, so if you looked at it that, for lack of better words, this is, these are the mailboxes for the apartments, okay? So whoever lives here, we don't usually t you associate zero with an apartment number, so I'll just put in a one for right here. So that's the person who lives in number one, number two, number three, number four, Number five, number six, number seven, and number eight. A little bit too big. All right. So just looking at that, that should make sense to everyone. Now, I don't care about the names of the people for right now. I don't care what their names are. But the point is, let, let's assume, and it's not, but let's assume that my address is 123 Main Street. Now, if someone wants to send something, and I'm in apartment four, let's say, and they want to make sure that it gets to me, it doesn't go to someone else or whatever, they'll probably send it to me at 123 Main Street, <coughs> apartment four. Oops. And again, that should make sense to you. All right. So if we did imagine that we had eight things in here, if somebody just puts it to, you know, sends it to Jeff Scott at 123 Main Street, it's probably going to get to me, all right? But I will tell you, it hasn't happened to me, but the person who lives in the apartment complex with me, there's somebody in number 23, and I'm not in 23. I get their mail all the time, I, we, and our names are not at all similar. I don't know if that's the mail person screwing up or what it is. It really doesn't matter, all right? So let's pretend for a second, and I'm just going to get, I'm trying to keep this simple, that Scott lives in apartment one. All right, Wilson, I'll make some of you stars, lives in apartment two. All right, El Hassan lives in apartment number three. Harris in apartment four. Sandbrink in apartment five. I'm screwing up the pronunciation of any of your names, I'm sorry. Williams in apartment six. Schmidt in apartment seven. All right. One, two, three, four. Nine. And I always forget maybe if it's Zetter or Zettler, but that's what it is now. All right. So, in other words, this would be the person that would go here. This would be the person here, the person here, etc. Does all that make sense? All right. So, if I wanted to set up something like this in a computer, again, we change this so that would be zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So if I wanted to set it up like this, there's actually two ways that I could do this. I could come in and say string, bracket, bracket. That means that you're going to use an array, all right? And they're brackets. They're not curly braces. They're not parentheses. They're brackets in this language, all right? And we're going to call this I don't know, APTS for apartments. And that is equal to, now I could put this in here if I want to initialize this. I need the double quotes. You should all know that. I need the double quotes because they're strings. I can line this up any way I want. I could put it all in one line, etc. The only reason I'm putting it onto two or three is so that you can read everything. So what I've done by doing that is I've set up something like this. What that means now is literally apartments zero equals Scott. 
All right, and I can keep going. Does it make sense to everybody what we're looking at? All right. And the reason that I'm showing you this, I'm not trying to waste my time. I'm not trying to waste your time. But what I'm trying to show you is I can do this. And again, that is using what's called an array initializer list. Or I can come in here and I can say string bracket bracket APTS equals new string eight. All right. Then if I do this line, I'm going to move this down. If I do this line, now I can fill it up like this. Do you understand the two ways that I can make an array? I can make an, em an empty array and then fill the stuff up like this. Okay? Or I can create an array and I can give it values immediately. So why does this even matter? It depends on the type of application that you're creating. If I'm creating an application and I've got 10,000 people who work for me for a company, I might do something like this. There might be 10,000. I'm not going to key it in as a programmer, but some data entry person is going to put that in. And when they put that in, they're not going to put in last names. They're going to do something like put in ID numbers. Does that make sense? And again, if, if all of a sudden we had 8,000 units instead of 8, that's all we'd have to do. All right. And as you're going to see as we go on in here, arrays work really, really well with loops. And in particular, arrays work really, really well with for loops. If you remember that from yesterday when we talked about loops, and we said a for loop is an, exa is an example of a definite loop. In other words, you have to know exactly how many times you're going through the loop. Well, in this language, when you create an array, I can change the values that exist in that array. So let's say I move out and Jones moves in. We can reset that to Jones. That's not a problem. What you cannot do in this language is you can't change the size of the array. So once you, change, once you set it, it's fixed in size. Does that make sense? And it's, it's a big difference from JavaScript. In JavaScript, you can change the size. You can't in this language. All right? So when we come through here and we start to create this stuff, again, I could keep going and put all the other ones in here, but that's an example of an, an array of strings. You can make an array of any data type. I can have an array of ints. I can have an array of doubles. I can have an array of booleans, et cetera. I can have an array of whatever. And I can have arrays that are in multiple dimensions. We probably talked about this last semester, but just kind of as a review, if I come through here and I create this, that's a two-dimensional array. All right? You're used to, if you use Excel, that you, you have your columns A through whatever and your rows 1 through whatever. The only difference is, if this is a two-dimensional array, that's 0 and that's 0. So the actual point of origin right there, that would be zero, zero. And you have to understand that. All right? So going back to the program, what I did in the program here is I just created an array. Now notice when I give it an initializer list, I don't put a number in it. I let the system figure out how many names are in here. And once I create this, it has five names. So if I had another kid, or, you know, because that's my family, or if I had got to put my pets there, I can't do that. I'd have to create a brand new array. So once you create an array, it's fixed in size in this language. All right, and this isn't on a test, but this is a term, believe it or not, I've had people who've, who've gone out of here and have interviewed for jobs, and this is a question you could be asked at a job interview, all right? Arrays in this language are known as being early binded. And what that means is at compile time, the system sets and it says there's one, two, three, four, five elements in the array. And it can't change. All right? So when something is set at compile time, when you compile a program, it's early binded. 
when we did arrays last semester in JavaScript, they were late binded, which means as the program is running, you can change things. You can't change the size of the array in this language. That once you've said it, that's the key point, the key takeaway from right here. Yes. So you're saying that once this has been run, you'd have to like delete the entire thing? No, I mean I could put new names in here. Okay. I can do that. But if I want to make it bigger, so let's say I want to expand it, right. then I create another array that's bigger in size and I copy all these names to it and then and then I could go and add more names. No, the, this is just the name I gave it. Okay. That there's nothing special about the name names. You can call an array anything. Right. It's just like yeah. any other variable. But what I'm saying is this particular array called names, we could set it up so there was nothing at all in it. So we could put five empty strings in it or something like that if we wanted to and put the names in later. But the point is we can't make it bigger than five. That's what I'm trying to get across. So if I run this right now, what am I doing here? I'm declaring an array. It's an array of strings, it's called names, and it has five elements, all right? So again, I, and I wanna make sure you understand this. This right here, this line, this is the same as if I came in here and did this. And I know it's what I just showed you, but it's, it's one of the more important parts of understanding arrays. I'm gonna comment this line out. And it's as though, geez, I went in here, now I said names, zero equal Jeff, and I kept going. And when you look at this, I have to get that a size. Now you might look at this and say, okay, I understand. Why wouldn't you do it the first way? It's a hell of a lot easier. What if I'm writing a program, be it a console program or a GUI program, where I have to ask the user the names of everybody in their family because I don't know them? Then I'm gonna do it like this where I'll come in here and I'll ask for a name and then I'll throw it into there. I'll ask for another name, throw it into there. Ask for another name, throw it into there, etc. Does that make sense? Because this has to click for you. In virtually every programming language you use, you will use arrays. All right? So I'm going to comment those back out and uncomment the top line. So I've got this array now, and it's got five what are called elements in it. And the way that you read this, just so you know, this would say here, names sub zero equal Jeff, names sub one equal Sandy, etc. Sub is a shortcut for subscript. So each one of the things that you see inside of the brackets are known as a subscript. All right? So we're saying names, I want to create an array named, a string array named names, and these are what are called the elements that are in the array. All right? So now what I'm saying in here is, I want you to go through the entire array, the array called names, and I made this variable up on the fly called name. So for each name that you find in the names array, write it out. So if this works then, again, the idea is it should say, the name is Jeff, the name is Sandy, the name is Taylor, the name is Mackenzie, the name is Chloe. And you'll notice that's a special kind of for loop that's called a for each loop. All right? You can only use for each loops with things that are known as being collections, and an array is an example of a collection. I could have also written that loop just like this. I could have said for.
that would have worked just as well. Okay? In fact, if I run this, what we should see are the same names in there twice. Okay? So you see I get the same exact output both ways. So the question is, okay, is one of these ways better than the other? All right, they both are three lines. It's whatever one makes more sense to you. But for each is a special kind of loop, and you can only use that loop with what are called collections. And, a, and a, uh, an array is an example of a collection. We'll look at some other ones later on in the semester. So we're doing that. We're creating the array. We're giving it values. Then we're printing them out. And we printed them out using both a for loop and a for each loop. All right? And then we say how many names there were in there. Does all that make sense? Does any of it make sense? All right? Because again, this is the, something that you're going to be working with. Okay? It doesn't have to be strings. So I've gone back and rewritten something in here where I put in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven test scores. Not in this class, of course, because no one gets the 34, but you get the idea that that's just, I'm just creating this simple second array, and that array is called scores. Now I'm going to comment this out again. Again, I'm commenting all of this out that we just did. And now I'm going to uncomment this. All right. So now I'm creating a new array. That's a numeric array. Again, I'm using what's called an initializer list. With an initializer list, you're giving it a list of values. Again, I'm not going to write it again, but this is the same thing as if I said score sub 0 equals 34, score sub 1 equal 91, etc. All right, and now I'm doing a couple different things here. What do I mean? I'm going to go and print out each score. So right there, that should print out the score is 34, the score is 91, the score is 87, the score is 58, the score is 100, the score is 90, the score is 69. That should make sense to you. And then as I'm bringing this in, I'm adding those to a variable called score sum. So in other words, this is 34 plus 91 plus 87 plus 58 plus 100 plus 90 plus 69. That's what that line right there, that line that you see in blue here, that line is doing this. So it's saying every time through here, grab the current value and add it. So this thing called score sum, if you remember from yesterday, that's an accumulator. It's accumulating the total of all of our scores. And then to find out the average, all right, we're grabbing that total and dividing it by scores.length, which are seven names. But if we do that, I'm dividing an integer by an integer, so it throws away, it throws away the decimal part. So I'm putting this in here, I'm doing what's called casting it, so that I keep the decimal. So if I save this and run it, maybe it'll make a little more sense. So what should happen is if I come back in here and use the calculator and I say 34 plus 91 plus 87 plus 58 plus 100 plus 90 plus 60, that's 520. That's the sum of all seven of those scores. Then if I come in and divide that by seven, because that's how many tests there scores there were, I get I don't know. 69 Did I write around? What's that? You put sixty instead of sixty-nine. Okay. 
Let's try it again. Because I want to I want to show you that it's right. 34 plus, thank you. 91. 87. 58. 100. 90. Oh, did I put 60 there? Okay, 69. Oops, not that. Okay. All right, so that should be 529 if I divide that by 7, 75.57. And I said I only wanted it to two decimal places. All right. But you'll see that let's, let's assume, and we don't get till files till the end of the semester, but let's say that, that I was working at a university and I had 500 students and I wanted to do this. All I'd have to do would be to read in a file with those 500 scores all right, I could add them up and I could get a class average. That's how easy it would be. All right, so when you're doing work with a lot of data of the same type, an array is a nice thing to use. And again, if I wanted to, I used another for each here, but we didn't have to use a for each. We could have used a for loop as well. Virtually every language that I know of offers both a for loop and a for each. Sometimes it's called for in, sometimes it's for each where the for and each are two different words, sometimes they're one word like in this language. All right? Does that make sense? All right. So I'm going to comment that out. Then what I did was I set up a bunch of new stuff. And again, I'm going to just break this down. And we're going to take a look at this. So there's a lot of code in here as far as what I just commented out. I'm going to create a new array that's called numbers. And I'm going to end up generating 10 random numbers. Okay? If I want to generate random numbers, I need to have that. That's seeding the rand. Then with those 10 numbers, I want the sum of those numbers. I want how many numbers I had. I want the average of those numbers. I want the highest number. I want the lowest number. Does all that make sense? All right. Because I'm going to beat this program to death. You're going to get it in this chapter. Then when we go into chapters nine and or eight and nine, seven and I guess seven and eight, we talk about methods. I'm going to take each one of these things and put it into its own method. All right. So this is just putting it into, into an infinite loop. So what are we doing here? Let's just break them up. I put comments in here. This will generate 10 random numbers. But I don't have to come in there and say, rand number one equals and do this, rand number two equals. So what, what you get using an array is rather than having 10 different arrays, with each one of those arrays having its own value, we now have one unit, like one mailbox, with 10 different values in it. So you end up writing a lot less code when you use arrays. All right? So this is going to generate the 10 numbers. So if I, you know, right here, just do this code that's right there, it's going to say something like the 10 numbers in the array are like 56 in a couple spaces, et cetera, et cetera. It's just going to keep doing that. That's what that's going to do everything that's between here and here. And then a blank line at the bottom. How do I know that? Well, I know it because I've done it, but let's just take everything else that's in here and comment it all out. Yeah, well, that isn't right. Oh, I know what it is. Yeah, it is the read line. Because since it's not, and since it's in an infinite loop, it's doing exactly what I told it to do. All right. So there's my 10 numbers. If I hit enter again, 10 more numbers. So again, if I asked you to do, for example, and I'm not, but some kind of a lottery program, 
this would be one way you could do it. Now, the only thing is, if you're doing it as a lottery program, the way this is currently set up, it may, not, may or may not have happened here, but you could have the same number in there more than once. But all we're doing in there, in, in here, is we're just telling the system to generate for us 10 random numbers, and then we're telling it to print them out. Does that make sense? If we wanted 100 random numbers, all right, all we'd have to do would be to change the size here from 10 to 100. I'm not going to do that because it'd be really ugly on the screen, but you get the idea. All right, so we're doing that. Then we come down here next, and we're figuring out what the highest number is and what the lowest number is. Let's do them one at a time. Now, I know that the highest, you know, well, I, I asked the system when they created the random numbers to create a number between 1 and 100. So if you look on the screen, and this shouldn't be a surprise to anybody, if I said, what's the highest number you can get? You said 100. That would make sense, right? What's the lowest number you can get? 1. All right, we could have made that a 0 because it is possible if you miss a test to get a 0 on it or if you don't put anything down. But I just made it between 1 and 100. All right? So if you look up here, I said highest to zero, and I said lowest to 101. Anybody have any idea why I would do that? Because it almost sounds kind of counterintuitive. If I make highest zero, okay? In fact, I could have set them both to zero if I, no, I, didn't, I wouldn't want to do that. If I said highest to zero, regardless of what number I read in for the first number, won't that be greater than zero? So that's automatically going to become my new highest number. Right. Whatever number I read in, would you agree, if it's between 1 and 100, it'll be lower than 101. So the same thing will happen. I'm giving them these default values because I'm going to replace them right away. In fact, I don't even have to give these a value. I could have not given them a value. Why? Because notice what I do in here. Oh, I guess I left it like this. That's fine. There's another way to do it, too. We'll just leave it the way it is. So what this is saying is, go through my list. Go through these numbers, these 10 numbers. If you find one that's higher than the current highest number, it becomes the new highest number. And then do the same exact thing for lowest. So if you look in here, if I save this, and it says the highest value in the array was 98. Well, if you look in there, that should be the highest value, and it is. If I hit enter again, the highest value in that second one is 90. So it's a way we're telling the system to go through the array and find the biggest number that's in there and find the smallest number that's in there. All right? What I'm going to do is, because it ends up printing kind of ugly here, I'm going to get rid of this right line that's here. Right. And where we had the read line, I'm going to put a blank line in there before that. So I'm going to remove this, too, because this is the smallest. All right, and I'm going to start commenting here. And before my read line, you'll see why in just a minute. Now when I run this, there's my 10 numbers. I hit enter, and it shows me the highest one and the lowest one. All right? And when you look through there, it should work every time. So what we're doing, what we're doing in here is when, when it comes in, let's just take a look at this one right here. All right? So it comes in, and previously, highest was set to 0. 87 is greater than 0, so it becomes the new highest one. All right? 
So it says, is that higher? No. Is that higher? No. Is that higher? No. No. Yes. So that becomes the new highest. Then it compares that one with this one. No. 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 So 88 is the highest. And it does the same thing with the lowest. Since lowest was initially set to 101, and 87 is lower than 101, that's now the lowest. Now that is. 39 still is. 39 still is. 27 is the new lowest. 27 is still the lowest. 6 is the lowest. 6 is still the lowest. 2 is the lowest. 2 is the lowest. And that's how you get those numbers. But we're just telling the computer to do it instead of having us do it. That's all. LCV is a placeholder right. that, that's just the current value, but go ahead. So the highest is because of the variable that you defined earlier as zero? Yes. If it's higher than that, then you're saying that right. highest is equal to that number that was the placeholder. Let, let, let's say that when we did this, you'll tell me when I get done if I'm answering your question or not. Let's say we didn't want to even give this a value. So we just wanted to say highest, we just wanted to say highest, and we just want to say lowest. Now, we'll get errors there, so let's comment that out. All right? So now highest doesn't have a value, and neither does lowest. But what we could have done in here, all right, is we could have come in here and said, now, notice we're getting that error because we didn't give it a value. All right? So we could have come in here before this, and we could have said highest, and we could have just set it equal to the first value in our array, regardless of what it is. But then when we start counting... Then we can start counting at 1. That's another way of doing it. All right? You'll see it both ways. And then I come back in here and do the same thing with lowest. And I'd say lowest equals that. And now I can again start counting at 1. And you'll notice when I run this, I'm still going to get the same stuff. Highest value and lowest value. So, you know, I, I don't particularly like that saying. But you've heard the saying, there's more than one way to skin a cat. There's more than one way of doing this. All right? So let's comment out the highest and the lowest. We don't care about that now. We know those work. So I'm just going to still want to generate the numbers and write them out. But everything that I have in here for the highest and for the lowest, for right now at least, I'm going to just comment it out. So next, I'm going to comment out again. So Next, I want to go through here and look at what this is doing. Exactly what I showed you before. If I've got, let's just say that the numbers, it's not going to happen, but let's just assume for a second that the 10 numbers generated were 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. This is saying sum equals 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7 plus 8 plus 9 plus 10. That's adding up the value of every array element. All right, so if I save this and run it, again, I don't have my read line. All right, and there it is, the sum. So if I add all these up, there's the sum. Again, I should have put a backslash n before that, but you get the idea. So I can keep doing this, there's another one, there's another one, etc. Does what's going on here make sense? Because you are going to have to do maybe not this, but you're going to have to do something where on your test for chapters 5 and 6 where you manipulate an array. Yes? Um, it's adding each one of the things to itself. That oh, saying. okay. Yeah, that's an error on my part. Yeah, it's adding this. These, these, you're right, these shouldn't be. So... How do I, you, you tell me, how do I fix that? It's real simple. I just come in here and do this. Right before I do this stuff here, I come in and I say, that should fix it. Yep. 
Now, every time you run this, think about it. If I had 100 in here 10 times, then the sum would be 1,000. If I had 1 in there 10 times, then the sum would be 10. So every time, and it's going to vary, but every time the sum should be somewhere around 500. You'll notice that it's not always. Sometimes it's up to 700, it's down to 269. That's actually a good thing because it's showing this really is random because it's kind of all over the board. All right. So if we come in here again and comment all of this out, all right, Actually, we have to leave the sum in there to do the average. So let me uncomment that. So we've got the sum. To do the average, all we want to do, all right, all we want to do for the average there is we want to take the sum and we want to divide it by the number of elements we have. And then we write that out. And notice I formatted it to two decimal places. All right, there's the sum, there's the average. And you can tell that should be 36, so this one should be 76.4, this should be 136.5, 201.1, no, not 20.11, I should say, et cetera. I guess it wasn't that. But I, I think with the line that I had in there where I was commenting out or setting sum equal to zero, I commented that out. So I have to come back in here, grab that line, comment that out, yeah. Comment that out. Now I should it should work. Yeah, and I know what it is. It's S sum. That's why it's why it's an error. And I can keep going. All right. And then the last thing that's really in here that I want to show you because these, what I'm showing you next, these are built into the language. All right, so what I'm saying is not every language has what you're going to look in here right now. Look at here. All right? And let's just do them one at a time. So if I did this right, notice what we're telling it to do. It says the numbers sorted in descending order. That's going to sort them in ascending order. Does that make sense? But there is no descending sort. So there's, you know, some languages have a sort and desort or something like that. But this one, you sort them in ascending order, then you tell them to reverse the numbers. That's all we're doing. All right. So if I save that. Hopefully I didn't screw it up. Uh, probably I'll need a read line in here, though. All right. So there's the numbers unsorted, and then they're sorted in descending order. Now, you can write your own routine to do this as well. It's not a problem. You can write your own routine. But why would you want to when there's already one that exists in the C-sharp library and then, you know, and then it's already been tested. You don't have to worry about it breaking. It, it should never break. And you'll see that every time these are now in descending order. All right? In the same way, if all I do is remove that reverse, which is what I did here, all right, if I just tell it to sort, now you'll see that they're going to be in ascending order. So now we've got it in there in descending order, and there it is in ascending order. All I've done is flip the order. That's it. And I don't really care now about them being in ascending or descending order, so I'm going to again comment all that stuff out and then just bring in the last stuff. This is kind of cool because most languages don't have what's in here on the end, all right? 
this is a built-in built in routine in this language that's called binary search. If you want to use binary search, you have to sort the array first in a setting order. So let's imagine, I'm just going to put, make it simple, I'm going to put five numbers up here. All right? 16, 37, 51, 89, and 99. And I want to check and see if 73 is in there. Now you can look at that because you're all intelligent people and they'll, no it's not. Okay. But the way that this works when you use this binary search is it grabs the number in the middle. It's kind of like the high-low game. And it says, is that the number? No, it's not, right? Okay, so we know, is it less than? Is this number less than this one? Or is this number greater than this one? Well, it's less than. So we know it can't be one of those three numbers, correct? So we look again, and we go right in half. So we actually go, probably it'll pick this, this number right here. So it says 89. And it says, nope, 89, that's greater. Well, it knows that that's the next number, so it knows the number can't be in there. So it automatically does a searching through a list for you. All right? And you might say, well, yeah, I could do that myself. Yeah, you're not the computer, but imagine that you had millions of numbers. And not only, let's, so let's say you had a million numbers. Yeah, if it was in order, you could check and see if it was there. Yep, it's there. All right? Okay, what, what location in the array is it? One, two, three, four. If it's like at a location 10,000, do you want to count 10,000 times? I don't. All right. So what we can do here is now when we run this, oh, let me pretty that up just a tad. All right. So we know we've got numbers in here, and we know what those numbers are. Remember, we start counting at zero. So I'm going to check for 97. And if this works, it should say it's at location 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Correct? All right. So it says enter a value to search for in the numbers array. 97. It was found in index 5. All right. Now, and I'll go back and show you the code for it in just a second. But what's interesting about this, okay, is if I come in here, so if I if I enter a value to search for, I don't know. Oh, oh I didn't uh, I didn't put it in ascending order. That's commented out. All right. But if I want to look, watch what happens if I put in something like this. It says it's not in the array. But what's really important about that is this line right here. Technically, if the number is not in the array. It's supposed to return minus one. But it can return any number at once. I was putting in bizarre numbers before, and it told me, yeah, it's in there. It's, it's, it's at array index negative 6,012. There is no negative 6,012. So you've got to check and say, if whatever you get returned is negative, then you say it's not in there. All right? So the only other thing I want to mention to you is this. Kind of a neat thing to have. That says that if you, if you put your program in a loop, every time it starts to loop over again, it's going to clear the screen first. So if you use a console program, just kind of a nice feature to have in there. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the beginning. We're going to take a break in just a second, but I'm going to go back to the beginning. I'm going to uncomment out, yeah, I'm going to uncomment out everything. Now, I'm sure it's going to look a little funky on the screen because I had a, a lot of, uh, of uh, read lines and or write lines and whatever that I put in there, so it's going to probably look weird. But hopefully you'll get the idea and you'll get to see the whole thing in action. You can run yours, too. Okay, so there's the 10 numbers. There's the highest. There's the lowest. There's the sum. There's the average. There it is in descending order. There it is in ascending order. I can check for a number. 52 should be at 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, location 6, and it is. All right. I can go and run this again. Notice that was the console not clear, so it cleared. I'm right at the top. There's nothing else in there. So again, boom, boom. And now if I search for a value that I know is not in there, so I'm going to put in 100, it says it's not in there. All right. So again, we're going to take a break, a healthy break. But the point is, what we did 
was you'd learn how to create an array, you learn how to go through an array, which is called either iterating through an array or traversing through an array. You learn how to find the biggest number in an array, the smallest number in an array, the sum of all the values in an array, the average of all the values in an array, how to sort an array in ascending order, how to sort an array in descending order, and how to do a binary search. And that's good because that's three quarters or more of the chapter. All right? So let's take a break. Let's come back at 9.15, and we'll pick it up from right there. Actually going into the book then. No, but usually when you get messages like that, if you click close program, you might have to start the program up again. Yeah, I've done that and it keeps coming back up. It's like that. Did you, Google, did you Google the error? It's a good no. Thank you. 